Hi everyone, and welcome to the second session of the day two of NUFA. And uh, we will have uh, one invited talk and two contributed talks to, uh, in this session. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Anna Levina, Dr. Anna Levina. She holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Göttingen. And uh, she has held uh, several uh, successful uh, postdoc position at uh, the Bernstein Center at ISTA in Vienna, uh, Max Planck Institute in Leipzig and uh, Tübingen, if I'm right. And she's now a research group uh, leader at the University of uh, Tübingen. Uh, so her research interest uh, spans several scientific fields, so mathematics, uh, physics, and neuroscience, and focuses on the, on the study of complex neural networks. So I hope we will hear about self-organized criticality and percolation or things like that, maybe. And so um, we understand it's, it's uh, we we uh, heard about this topics in the previous talks already, and it's a broad interest for the, for the community in neuroscience and particularly the spiking neural network uh, aficionados in, uh, at SNUFA. So welcome, Anna, you have 30 minutes plus some minutes plus some time for questions and so we will make 45 minutes so that we have time for other speakers the stage is yours hello uh hope you can see my slides then does it work Great. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I already heard some talks that feel like they are very intimately connected with what I would be talking about. And this would be primarily uh, about the time scales. Uh, on one side, how, the, how we extract time scales from spiking data and what is special uh, about the biologically observed time scales. On the other side, how artificial systems using it. Uh, full disclaimer, I am normally mainly computational neuroscientist and uh, lately was doing also a lot of modeling with more like rate neurons, but I'll try my best. And I think that we are very closely connected in many topics. Okay. So I would skip the long introduction in the beginning and have introductions along the way. Uh, and my ambitious plan for today is to have three stories. One, the first one would be primarily about the biology and about uh, changes in time scales and spiking activity uh, while animal performs attentional task. Then I would discuss how many time scales and in which form we need to reproduce spiking activity of the neuron and how this could be used to uh, solve long memory tasks. And then I would discuss in my mechanistic a model, but still on the machine learning side, uh, whether there are some better and worse ways of generating slow time scales. So we start uh, right with biology. Uh, and the first question is, like why would we expect different time scales? Uh, and for many people, this would be sufficient to think about having just very many different time scales in the behavior uh, if we are in the scene uh, and uh, there is something approaching from the left uh, in a very high speed, we would probably react very rapidly. Uh, if we are uh, contemplating uh, the uh, beautiful sloths in the uh, Stuttgart saw, uh, then might spend a while and our behavior might also be influenced by slow scene. Uh, so in general, we do see very different time scales of behavior, including very slow computations and developments that we are doing over very many uh, hours, days, and maybe weeks. Uh, so the hypothesis was that the necessity of uh, having the behavior on this multiple time scales would probably be required. Uh, reflected in the time scales uh, of activity in the brain. And as was mentioned before, the first very solidly gathered support for this hypothesis uh, were, uh, what was uh, from a study of John Murray, who uh, collected the data uh, from of spiking activity from different brain areas and showed that along the visual pathway, the higher brain area, which means more related to computation, the slower time scales would be uh, as opposed to the uh, early 
earlier uh, areas where the input is more processed rather than something more sophisticated is computed. So this was observation made in spikes. Later on, uh, similar observations were made in various different modalities, and now there is more spiking data that supports the idea that there is something hierarchical on time scales. Here, we look at time scales of uh, big brain areas, averaging multiple neurons. If we would zoom in and look at individual neurons, what was also observed that the, uh, during a task, neurons with different time scales would be involved in different parts of the task, and if a sub Object, uh, is uh, engaged in some, for example, memory task, that intrinsic time scales might change. So these time scales are not just hierarchical, they're also flexible and somehow related to what neurons are doing. Uh, in this project that was mainly done by my PhD student, Roxana Zarati, in collaboration with Tatiana Engel and the Anand Shi now uh, in Princeton, uh, we were asking where the time scales are changing rapidly during task performance, and these changes could be pinned down locally, not just on the whole brain area, but in very local populations. And we were questioning what could be mechanisms that would generate these changes. Uh, so to uh, set up the scene, like what do we mean by time scale? Uh, as a, for time scale, we're measuring the autocorrelation function, that is a covariance of a signal with its time-shifted version uh, normalized by the variance. In many physical processes, this, time, th this autocorrelation function looks like an exponential decay. So the longer the temporal difference between the uh, events, the smaller is uh, covariance between them. We already seen this type of uh, curves uh, in the previous talks. Uh, and even easier it is for us to characterize time scales if we look in log lens uh, uh, representation where the time scale, this tau, would be related to the slope. It would be one over slope. So if the uh, decay is very slow, so slope is very close to zero, the time scale is very large. If the time scale is short, this means that the relationship between events is vanish vanishing very fast. So here is a bit about the data. Uh, it was recorded already a long time ago in two different labs from a multi-electrode array that was inserted perpendicular to the cortical surface in the area V4, which is a visual uh, area in a macaque monkey. And the monkey was doing a spatial attention task uh, where it had to detect uh, small differences in the presented stimuli, and it was cued uh, to uh, indicate where most probably the uh, difference would happen. In uh, uh, four options that we see here, there are two that are absolutely not related to the attentional task. And, he, he, uh, and if we record from the neurons that have receptive fields uh, in these areas, so these are neurons that are responsible for us understanding the scene in, in the parts which are not related to attention, we still can measure an autocorrelation function from the activity, spiking activity that we record there. Uh, and it would look approximately like this. Here I show the average over multiple trials. And what I see here is that there is something rapidly decaying in the beginning for very short lags, and then there is some slower process uh, later on. So uh, my hypothesis would be that there are at least two dominant time scales that are describing this autocorrelation function. Uh, what is happening for the big lags uh, is a, a short duration of recordings cutoff. Uh, if you're interested in more measurement uh, options uh, and how to uh, define time scales, we made a separate paper on it. Uh, if we look at attentional conditions, uh, and these are both conditions towards the uh, attentional cue and the opposite because the uh, monkey had to report uh, opposite to the uh, area of change. So the preparational movement also somehow related to this attention. Uh, then we can still group the trials where we recorded from receptive fields of the neurons that are related to the attention signal. And uh, we see that the autocorrelation function look different. Uh, even though it looks very similar for short lags, it is slower or they decay slower uh, for the longer lags, which 
makes us to pause the hypnosis is the slow time scale increases during attention. If we were to describe the uh, autocorrelation function with the two primal time scales. Uh, and uh, uh, if you're interested in how to fit it, uh, this is a paper where we discussed a lot of different biases that are there uh, and how to combat them. But assuming that we uh, already developed this method where we can, in a Bayesian way, uh, estimate the time scales, we could take the real data. So this is uh, noisy data uh, from a uh, real trial. Uh, and we could check, is it better fitted by single time scale model that is a light green uh, or by two time scales models that is a dark green? Uh, and we can not just visually observe this, but we can also use uh, um, solid Bayesian uh, inference to decide which model is a better descriptor of the data, given that we have more parameters if we have two time scales. Uh, and indeed, for this particular example, two time scales is a better model. And if we look at the whole data and all sessions and all, all our monkeys, three monkeys that we had data from, uh, in most cases, two time scales describes the data the best, and very few are described by one time scale. In some sessions, we could not uh, easily decide. This ones we would not consider. Uh, and here we can then compare both time scales. We decided that there are two time scales that are described in the data. We can compare it between the two conditions attention or without attention, that is called attention away. Uh, and for this uh, example session, that is very clear uh, session, uh, it is visible that the short time scale for the events that are happening in a very short lags are basically overlapping. Here I'm plotting the posterior distributions. So all the distribu distribution of all the parameters that are compatible with the data. And they're overlapping, which means that they are same. However, if we are looking at the distribution of the slow time scale that is describing the tail, uh, it is much longer if the monkeys are tending towards the receptive field. And here we pull the data from all the sessions and all the monkeys, and there is still a very clear difference between the slow time scales and no significant difference between the fast time scales. Uh, we were also excited to have a look at how these time scales relate to uh, actual performance on the monkey, uh, where we've seen that if we look at the uh, slow time scale in the cases where, man where this time scale is actually describing the attentional uh, modulation, so when monkey was attending over the stimulus, uh, the slower time scales that would also be related to being closer to the critical point, to a little bit connect to the criticality uh, intro, uh, would, re uh, would result in a faster reaction times. Uh, however, if monkey was not attending, uh, the time scales were not informative uh, about the reaction time of the monkey. Uh, so it seems like these time scales are relevant and they're definitely changing with attention. The question is, where are they coming from? And we try to make the simplest models. And here we are looking at the, uh, at the uh, spiking model with uh, uh, two diverse biophysical uh, options, how to create uh, two time scales. We've seen two. So let's assume that we would just combine something fast, for example, the um, uh, fast decay of uh, liquid in the membrane, or, and something slow, for example, the slow synaptic filtering. This is a model uh, proposed by Behran and, and Astorich. Uh, and by combining these two, we can generate very similar shapes of autocorrelation functions. On the other side, we can uh, get a very spatially structured network uh, with a, a connectiv recurrent connectivity between neurons that would generate a slow uh, activity traces uh, and have still a fast uh, individual neuron time scale. Uh, this way, we also can generate the same uh, pairs of time scales as in a case where in random network we have two different time scale processes. So how can we compare this very basic uh, mechanisms of generating a time scales? We can use the fact that this uh, spatial structured network would also have a sp spatial structure in cross correlations. In the 
a random network, as we would expect, the cross correlations between neurons and space would be basically uh, hovering around zero and would not have any dependence on the distance. Uh, in the uh, network with spatial structure, and here the color indicates how far apart are the neurons, uh, we would uh, have the, first of all, a similar structure of multiple time scales in the cross correlation, uh, and we would also have a non zero cross correlations. Uh, so, this might be an opportunity for us to select. We have these two different options, and we can also even make some analytical statements about computing the cross correlations in this network. Uh, however, the best part is that we can go to the data back and look at the uh, time scales recorded from slightly tilted electrode, where the distance between neurons, we don't know exact distances and not, don't know what are the relevant dif distances, but uh, we approximate them by distance uh, of their receptive fields. Uh, and we split them into groups of short receptive field distance and the long receptive field distance. And we see that, first of all, they all have a structure that looks somewhat like the autocorrelation functions, similar to our um, cross-correlations in the spatial uh, structured model, and that there is also some time scales to, uh, and some dependence on the distance in the cross-correlations. Uh, which we can also then measure, and we can measure how the slow uh, cross-correlation would be uh, depending on whether it is on short receptive field distance or long receptive field distance, and this would be only competit uh, compatible with our spatial uh, connectivity structure model. So from the minimal options of how to generate two time scales, we would clearly prefer the spatially structured network to a network that just have randomly uh, put in uh, two time scales processes without any uh, connectivity structure. So for this part, uh, here's an intermediate summary. Uh, first of all, uh, we've seen that the local spiking activity seems to have multiple time scales. And I showed that we can uh, indicate at least two uh, that would be dominating the autocorrelation function. Uh, that the slow uh, of these two time scales is modulated by attention and seems to be behaviorally relevant. And that if we want to model this emergence of the slow time scales, it seems that uh, local connectivity structure might be a good uh, proposal mechanism for generating it. So we remember this for a while and look at if we want to understand actual time scales. Now we just had two also because our uh, neurons were very simplified and the way we could record input and output was very simplified. Uh, if we would have a fully complex neurons, how many time scales we would need uh, to capture them? Uh, in general, our ideal uh, picture would be that we know the whole inputs and we also record an output of the neuron. And here is a problem, the output we can record, uh, but we can't really easily establish all the inputs to a single biological neuron. Uh, and here I would be using a data set that is generated by making a very, very detailed biophysical model uh, to introduce all, uh, all inputs and the output. And it was, it was published and first used uh, to approximate the input-output relationship of the spiking neuron by a temporal convolution network. Uh, Aaron uh, asked whether this is a reasonable approximation to use the temporal convolution networks as something that is inherently fit forward and the only temporal dependencies you're generating by including the, convolutional, the temporal convolution window. Uh, and he proposed to look at uh, the model that is more recurrent structured with a multiple memory units, a little bit similar to memory cells in LSTM that have different time scales. And these time scales would be trainable. And uh, we also found that they are ideally initialized uh, in the logarithmic space uniformly distributed. Uh, so what we would need then is to train the nonlinearity that is uh, for us parameterized 
by multi-layer perceptron uh, and train all the time scales parameters of the memory units to produce spikes uh, as an output. So here is the trace, the blue is the voltage trace of the simulated by physical neuron, uh, pink are spikes on top, and the green is prediction for the spikes uh, from the model, where we are very accurately matching. Uh, that's a good example. Uh, however, the bad examples also look quite good. Uh, and here, what I'm showing in uh, um, blue tones are uh, the model uh, using our recurrent uh, cell uh, uh, and uh, uh, the yellow one is a classical LSTM model without this uh, uh, different time scales initialization uh, and the darker red is a temporal convolutional network. And I'm showing how well they are predicting spikes and voltages uh, depending on how many parameters we allow the models to have. And what we can readily ap appreciate that between the temporal convolution network uh, and our uh, recurrent uh, model, uh, there is three orders of magnitude difference in number of parameters, uh, with uh, uh, LSTM being somewhat in the, uh, in the middle, but still having much more parameters uh, to capture the same quality of prediction of spikes. So it seems to be a good um, a, a good uh, structural uh, suggestion for how to uh, actually um, capture the spikes. Uh, and our idea was that we can use this uh, uh, leaky memory uh, neuron to understand how the biological neurons work or how the models work. And for this, what we would need, we would be uh, changing the parameters or the initial the the ranges of hyperparameters that uh, that the network is allowed to take, and would check whether it is still able to rep to ac access the good prediction quality. As a, an insanity check, we can instead of taking the full biophysical model check takes a simply leak integrate and fire model or adaptive leak integrate and fire model. And what we appreciate here is that the larger the model complexity, the more memory units we need to capture what is happening, uh, to, to capture the spikes. So it seems like these models use the uh, uh, time scales that it allowed to train and it requires more and more the closer we are to biophysical neurons. And it would be very exciting if we would have multiple models of different biophysical neurons to compare how their morphology relate to how many time scales we need to capture the activity. Uh, but we can also use these neurons in a task. And here is a task that was already uh, mentioned, uh, the Heidelberg spiking uh, a spoken digit uh, uh, data set where the spoken numbers are translated into a putative spikes from putative hair cells, which would afterwards be an input to our neuron. And in the end, this neuron needs to find out what was the number. And because this task was feel, uh, still feeling kind of not uh, sufficiently hard, we updated it by adding uh, a second layer where the uh, task of the network would be to listen to two, uh, two numbers spoken and then report the sum of those. And uh, we see that this task is harder. So here I'm plotting accuracy versus either how expressive the nonlinearity is. So this uh, 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 DM tells how large is the multi-layer perceptron that is, uh, or two-layer perceptron that we are using. Uh, and we can uh, appreciate that for the same identification, we need much uh, larger uh, perceptron to be able to solve the task if it is addition. And at the same time, we can also check what are the ranges of time scales that we allow in network to have. Uh, the both are solving the addition task and identification clearly. Uh, if we allow to have all the different time scales between very short and very long, but if we cut the long time scales, the performance is decreasing. So these long time scales are necessary to solve this task. Um, and we could also ask a classical model. So here we're using 
simple spiking neural network or LSTM to solve the same task of addition. Uh, and they can't do it if we just give the data the way uh, it is presented for our model. However, we could try introducing a little bit slower time scale by binning the data in larger and larger bin sizes. And this recovers a little bit the performance of LSTM, uh, but it's still never getting uh, really much better than uh, than our recurrent uh, multiple time scales uh, cell. Uh, and the decrease for large bin sizes is because we actually have less information then on this side. Uh, and as a last check, we also looked at the really classic uh, state of the art uh, hardness um, tasks for uh, long uh, memory. Uh, for example, here is Pathfinder that is uh, ridiculously hard and is failed by uh, transformers and log formers, but is solved by our neural network, though clearly a bit worse than the state of the art specifically tuned uh, networks. So we can have enough computational power. And to sum this part up, uh, we can match nicely input and output uh, of spiking uh, neuron uh, with a few parameters by introducing explicitly the time scales uh, into the recurrent uh, model. Uh, if we have a spiking input that has a slow, uh, complicated temporal pattern and is delivered in just very brief pulses, we actually require long time scales to be able to do something with this um, uh, very abrupt point processes inputs. Uh, and uh, we can use the same model if we max out a number of parameters to solve uh, also uh, very hard uh, tasks. And now, just very briefly, uh, if we would combine these two ideas, we allow different time scales and we are trying to solve tasks, what would be mechanisms an artificial network would select to produce these long memory time scales? Uh, for biophysics, we've seen that simple options would be to put in the diverse biophysical time scales or to have a spatial connectivity. We can have both of them also in the artificial recurrent neural network. And so we would ask what would be for them as the best way to generate long time scales for solving memory tasks. And this was a project led by Sina together with Roxana. And here we used discretized leaky integrate and fire neurons, uh, uh, where we would have an explicit time scale parameters that could be trained by the network. And there would be implicit influence on the time scales through both the uh, explicit time scales, but also all the recurrent interactions. So what we can do, we could uh, measure the activity of individual neurons in our recurrent network and measure the effective time scales, same way as we did for the biological neurons and evaluate what's happening with this effect, uh, effective time scales and where their changes are coming from. We know from our analytic work for the monkey project uh, that these effective time scales are both influenced by weights and the by physical time scales. Uh, and if the connectivity is random or weak, they would be very similar to the individual by physical time scales. But if it is strong and structured, then it would be much lower. And now we need a task. So we have a very simple uh, task for this network to solve. It needs to solve n parity task. So this task we know uh, from previous research would require progressively longer time scales for larger and larger memory requirements, larger and larger window for the n parity. And so far it was shown for uh, n up to five. And here is the reason, even if we train it with backprop through time, it's very hard to solve uh, for n larger than 10. Mm. So we needed to come up with some solutions that allows to train these networks more efficiently. And what we did, we did a curriculum learning. So we can slowly increase the n for which we train from two to very large numbers, and this way be able to solve progressively longer tasks. So this is a single head curriculum. 
uh, but it has a drop forgetting then afterwards most probably what was learned in the previous time steps and not being able to solve task for small n. Uh, on the other side, uh, we can also just add additional readout, keeping the same recurrent network uh, and first train to only read out n equal two, then additionally together with to read out three and so on uh, uh, up to very large numbers. And this we call a multi-head curriculum because we have a multiple readout heads. Uh, if we look at how the training behaves, the surprising thing is that the multi-head curriculum trains better. So it can train to larger maximum n in the same amount of time. And it seems to be able to train to larger uh, n's in total. And after we train the network, if we determine parameters, it is uh, staying uh, stable and continuing having a good relative accuracy for the larger perturbations than if we had uh, trained it with a single head curriculum. But what we were interested in looking at the uh, time scales. And first of all, we looked at this biophysics like uh, leak time scale. And what we see is that after some small uh, uh, and around 15, we would have a steady increase of this uh, time scale of individual neuron for single uh, head network. However, the multi-head network would continue decreasing. And even more, we can just fix the time scales at a single level. So for the single head network, uh, it would, if we fix it at any level and not let it be trained, the performance would deteriorate uh, dramatically. However, for this multi-head learning, we could just uh, fix it at the shortest possible length, that is the time scale of the input, like basically what is the time step, uh, and it would be, perform as good a, as when we were trained. So if we would continue to the infinity, uh, we would probably converge to having the same time scale as an input. Uh, but what was for us the most interesting is to look at the effective time scales, and they are growing very similarly uh, for both of these networks. So as we would expect, this time scales in the activity are actually still matching the task. However, the individual time scales be behave very differently. So what we can deduce from it that in a single head uh, learning, because we have the increase in the individual time scales and the individual leak of neurons, they are probably quite, and, and because we know that by fixing, we, de uh, we destroy the performance in learning, they are important for generating the effective time scales. However, for the multi-head network, we can fix uh, the individual time scales on the shortest uh, possible range and only weight would be important. Thus, what we can summarize is that they both somehow solving the task, uh, however differently. And in single head, they rely to a large extent on the single neuron, individual neuron properties and in the multi-head, they rely on the network interactions. And this seems to bring benefits. It trains for larger ends, and it generates more robust solutions. So it seems that this would be preferred option, and it is also compatible with what we know from the monkey study. So to summarize this part, uh, that the tasks with larger memory requirements, we confirm that they would require a slow effective time scale. So the time scale of the output of the neuron. However, this effective time scale, they can be generated by different mechanisms. Uh, so if we generate this, log, this effective time scales, the long effective time scales by recurrent interactions, it seems like we would generate a better trainability of the network uh, and a better uh, network in the end. Uh, and uh, if we uh, additionally add this curriculum bias uh, by training to multiple tasks simultaneously, we would pre the network seems to prefer this uh, spatial structured uh, uh, way. Uh, and this is just to summarize. So this were the projects uh, I presented. Uh, biological papers are over here. Then we have the paper on how to map the uh, individual uh, neuron input output relationship with the recurrent network and how to solve tasks with them. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank my group who were doing the work, uh, my founders who were paying for it, and clearly you for your uh, attention. And uh, I would welcome questions.
Many thanks, Anna, for this uh, wonderful talk. We have many questions, and uh, please uh, go and look at the questions for all the audience and to vote for the one you want to be answered. So I'll begin by um, the first by uh, Reina Engelken, um, which I will just read. I discovered. Uh, great talk, part one. Are the slow time scales observed in the data primarily generated by local cortical circuits, or do they also depend on slow thalamic inputs or thalamocortical loops? How will you model these interactions? Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting bi bi biophysical question. Uh, in our analytics, the first step was to just uh, work with linear, sorry, uh, spiking kind of, but linear uh, neurons. Uh, and they are this uh, very similar what you are doing. Every all, all the feedbacks look quite the same. However, if we would introduce a nonlinearity in the uh, in the input output relationship of individual neurons, then having a feedback would shift effectively the, uh, how strong are the interactions in the network or how much the interactions in the network, uh, how much we need of interactions in the network to elicit a spike. So it would be similar. Increasing the local feedback uh, would act very similar to increasing the synaptic strength efficient effectively in the local area. So we can realize the same thing by or the increase of, of the time scales we can realize by having a telemic feedback. Mm. Hope this answers somewhat your question. Okay, great. Um, so we have a second uh, question by uh, Maria Aradia Ilms. Do you have, oh, it moved. And do you have any hypothesis or research in relating the different time scales to common large scale networks of the brain? Mm. Okay, so uh, oh. I'm not sure, like large scale network, you mean maybe, I, I would interpret it as a network structure. Uh, so in a small, like in a very local view, we have a strong locally connected populations over the um, longer pathways, probably generating slow, like just using this, uh, uh, highly correlated uh, recurrent connectivity might be not sufficient. So there are probably are multiple different uh, players over the large larger brain scale. Uh, what uh, was already shown that it seems to be that the time scales over the brain seems to correlate with some of the uh, expression like gene expression data. So there are some genetic components and there are components that are not related to connectivity. Uh, however, what we show is that the connectivity might play a very important role and uh, particularly in adjusting the time scales. Okay, great. So we have an, another question uh, by uh, Friedemann Zinke. Uh, mm -hmm. In relation to Philippos talks, the, the, the one we heard just before, uh, we showed that time scales are particularly beneficial if they increase and also Pao uh, Pao uh, gave mm -hmm. some theoretical insights yeah. and interesting. Do you also see benefits or uh, of some ordering of these time scales, time scales in the ELM across the dendritic tree or similar? Uh, okay, so uh, we don't have that like in in the uh, sorry in the vanilla ELM we don't have very clear uh, way of what is what is space. Uh, what we see, it is good to initialize broadly spaced, the time scales. That is a good inductive bias for initialization, even if we train them. Uh, I would, so we need some space and some structure. Uh, in the, what, what is also happening, because LM is recurrent, and what we see in a recurrent setting, uh, the interactions can change the time scales a lot. Uh, as long as the propagation was uh, in the Philippa stock was fit forward, it was kind of clear who depends on what and how the next time scales are uh, generated. We actually did something of the similar type when we, for, for, the, uh, for the third project, 
uh, we also tried having different modules and train them like also growing the reservoir together with the growing the task. And then the modules that were responsible for the faster task, the simpler task would have a fast time scale and it would generate similar hierarchy. So uh, I feel that there is some relationship that if we can sp split who is doing what, then the one who need to integrate over longer times need a longer time scales somehow. Uh, but if we don't have structure, then we would not know who, uh, whose job is what. So for ELM, uh, we did not generate clear structure. They are all uh, feeding from the same MLP and they are all feeded afterwards in the uh, predictor uh, layer. Uh, so we can't see it, but it would be very exciting to add some structure or maybe to kind of force them in some way uh, to, to see this here. I also found it very interesting in Philippe's talk. Okay, great. Uh, I had a question on the, on the uh, autocorrelation uh, uh, mm -hmm. the profile you, you have shown. Uh, it shows a very uh, uh, fast drop at uh, very slow yeah. time scales. So is that mm -hmm. under the time scale? And is it related to the uh, uh, No. So uh, we do have like the, the drop that is related to the spiking I'm not showing. It is basically the drop between zero yeah. and one. There is, a, there is this drop and we were also fitting it. What we also found out that this that at least for our spiking data, using the Poisson generation mechanism is not good. So we also allowed a variance to not match the mean. Uh, and then we could match the first drop. The drop that is happening on the large lags, this is bias in estimation. So like if we would plot the autocorrelation function over multiple trials, it is a biased estimation of the true autocorrelation over the infinite time series. And this bias is uh, like, uh, I, I can only add, like I, did, I could remove this slide from my presentation. I guess it would take too much to, 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 to put it in, but this bias is, is generate, like look at this one. The bias is generated by the fact that we had to combine data from just say one second uh, trial lengths. And uh, this always would produce it. Uh, and if there are additional like spike generation, multiple time scales and oscillations, there is no uh, analytical way to uh, account for this bias. Although for pure autocorrelative, uh, autoregressive process, we like it's as always uh, in 50s, it was proven that there is a bias and you can even compute it analytically out, but for more complicated processes, not. Okay. And Thank you. And, and the one you, you show here is, is for one neuron or is the average on the population? So uh, what we had to do, like we, 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 have, we, we have for few of the neurons, but uh, because we have not very long recordings and these neurons have not enormously high firing rates, we just not get, an, uh, we would just not get enough data for most of the neurons to estimate. We have now uh, uh, use the uh, data from international brain laboratories that have much longer yeah. traces where we could estimate it for individual neurons. Here, it is kind of synchronized populations that are over different layers in the same cortical microcolumn putatively. Uh, and it was shown to be very synchronized in the larger activity switching in the previous papers. So we kind of pulled the spikes together over multiple electrodes. Um, to compute it. And here it is also additionally smooth because we pulled multiple sessions of the same condition. But we could do it for individual neurons, it's just for very few of them it would be significant. Yeah. I understand. Great. We are perfectly on time. Thanks a lot, Anna. And uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Thanks. Thank you.